Hey, Steph listeners, hear about the latest trends in the travel industry with the brand USA Talks Travel Podcast. Right now, listen to special live from IPW interviews featuring U.S. Travel's Jeff Freeman. DMOs are at the heartbeat of U.S. Travel. Liz Bittner from Travel South. A lot of key gateway markets are back. L.A. Tourism's Adam Burke. We all win when we all partner together. Plus, brand USA's Stacey Melman and Jackie Ennis with international travel trends and Chris Thompson's farewell finale. I'm Mark Lapidus. Join us for brand USA Talks Travel on your favorite podcast platform. Brand USA Talks Travel. You're listening to the Skift Podcast. Today we present a previously unreleased discussion from our Skift Megatrends event in London last month. Pranavi Argarwal, Senior Research Analyst for Skift Research, speaks with Trip.com General Manager for Europe, the Middle East and Africa, Andy Washington, in a session titled Reaching the Emerging Traveler. You can read Skiff's Megatrends for 2024 right now at skiff.com slash megatrends. Enjoy the conversation. Please join us in welcoming General Manager EMEA for Trip.com Group, Andy Washington, in discussion with Skift Senior Research Analyst Pranavi Agarwal. Hi Andy, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me here. Hello everyone. So Trip.com is of course one of the world's largest OTAs and it is a global company but it is particularly well known in China and and in Asia and we'll talk about the kind of expansion efforts into into the rest of the world as well but um, perhaps you can just kick it off with an overview of where we are um, on the road at the moment, kind of the growth patterns you're seeing in different regions around the world. Yeah, I think um, obviously with what happened with COVID from a European perspective, we saw that mass rush to the beach. The Brits feed the Germans, get the towels down as quick as we could. <laughs> Everyone got to the beach. Then city break started to come back. Domestic was all, always in play and has, has kept up high. And then the last parts to come from that after city breaks was long haul. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're starting to see now. I think the difference then with Asia was Asia could learn from the mistakes that Europe made of open everything up, couldn't cope with it in terms of resources, put every flight possible on, and then have operational issues. Asia learned from that. And as that opened up, we saw Thailand was probably the first destination that opened. Dubai, as you spoke about a minute ago, opened up in terms of the Middle East. And that allowed lots of demand and customers to go there. That started to pair back a bit bit now as other countries have opened up. Long haul's come back into play. But what Asia did was put on various flights. Not as many. Operationally, we're much smarter than that. So what we're seeing now, as we are big, as you said, there in Asia, is an old long haul now coming out of Asia into Europe. That's mm-hmm. starting to, to boom now. We've seen for China, with Chinese New Year just around the corner, a 20, uh, 20x increase in demand in the 20 last 20 times? Weeks. Yes. Okay, wow. Okay, so China's now open. The visa problems have started to go away. That's become more operationally <laughs> easier. And we're about to 80% of capacity versus last year of where it is. So they've been smarter, been a bit slower than Europe in terms of opening up, but that's created a better consumer experience, but the volume is there um, in abundance. I think we can't talk about Trip.com if you don't talk about, about China, and you touched on this a little bit just already now, but how have you seen the Chinese consumers have changed over the pandemic? How have their preferences changed? So d- domestic was, was always the big play for it. We're seeing, again, great performance in terms of the domestic uh, business. Now they're starting to travel back out. So Hong Kong came into play very, very quickly. Thailand, in Inter-Asia. Long hauls now started to come back into play. So I'm seeing them start come back into the, the European markets. The great thing about the Chinese consumer is they're a hotelier's dream. Long length of stay, high value, four or five star consumer. Mm-hmm. They like to spend money um, on experiences, which mm-hmm. is another one of your trends that you've shown there. They really like to get into the cultural elements of it. So they're, they're a dream for any hotel or travel partner. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we saw that luxury really led the recovery in Europe and the US over 2022 and 23. Are you seeing that luxuries also leading the recovery out of Asia? Is it going to follow the similar playbook we saw in the West? Yeah, I I, I think there's a bit of a red herring in there, though, because Mm -hmm. people had money and that middle class that you've spoken about in one of your trends as well. The middle class and the upper class had the money coming out of COVID and spent a lot on travel. That's starting to burn out. But as cost of living crisis hit everywhere, as inflation's hit everywhere, um, 
everything's very expensive, very, very expensive. We, we spoke earlier about mm -hmm. my daughter wants to go to New York in June. She asked me how much will a flight be? It'll be over four or five hundred pounds. She can't get anything less unless she's going on a real low cost carrier to New York for a thousand pounds. And that blows my mind, but you know, I've worked in this industry a long, long time. To hear those sorts of prices to New York is you know, hugely expensive. But the red herring in there is because that has pushed prices up. But as Adam was saying, they, they won't go back down. They'll stay there. That's the industry we're living in. Those prices will stay high. But people are, are burning through that money now. Mm -hmm. So we will start to get back to the normal patterns. So that's in, in the West. But if we talk about people coming out of the pandemic in Asia, they do have, they do have they, that they do. savings, they right? They do. So, so they have those savings. Yeah. So there's a boom there. Um, how long that will last for will mean to be okay. seen. Uh, the economies are quite robust in Asia. Yeah. So um, I want to talk a little bit about more, a little bit more about China. So, yeah, I mean, outbound travel out of China is going to rapidly recover. I think there's no kind of question about that. Once the floodgates are open, these Chinese travelers do want to travel. But I was looking at some data in China, in you know, you know, in in the market of China, and you can see on these charts here that. Chinese occupancy, uh, the recovery of Chinese occupancy is in line with the rest of Asia. But when you look at pricing, China pricing is lagging the rest of Asia. Why is it that China is not being able to display such pricing strength as the rest of Asia is? Uh, di different demand patterns, different mm -hmm. market. Um, and then also there's some restrictions about outbound versus domestic. Mm -hmm. That's what it's really been about. So supply and demand in, in effect. Um, we are seeing pricing start to increase. We have got the demand in the market, both domestically and then exiting now. Uh, as visa restrictions come out of play, you're going to start to see more of the outbound part come as well. It's just following the patterns of Europe, but, uh, but peaking now and starting to come up. Do you think that post-COVID consumers have discovered other parts of Asia they might not have heard about, and actually the demand into China is not going to be as strong as everyone says it's going to be? Oh, no, I expect it to be, and, and I hope it will yep. be, but I'm expecting it and seeing it in the patterns that it, it will be hugely important. But also the cultural elements of China are now starting to be exposed more and understanding because that social storytelling opens that up to the consumer to understand what you can do there, um, how you can do it. And, and working for, for Trip.com in the last couple of years has really opened my eyes to the perceptions versus the reality. Right. Let's talk about another superpower in Asia, and that's India, and Sarah already touched a little bit about this. But there is this huge outbound opportunity coming out of India, primarily from this rapidly kind of rising middle class in, in India. Is this on your radar? Are you altering your strategy to meet this new type of demand? Are you, are you ready for it? Uh, I think it's always been there. The VFR market with India has always been very strong, particularly with the UK. So that's always VFR been meaning the film industry? Uh, no, so your, your friends and relatives. Oh, friends and relatives, sorry. Yep. Um, so that market has always been strong and has always been there. Uh, for our group, trip.com group, we... Um, <laughs> We have Make My Trip in India yes. rather than Trip.com. So that's more specifically a brand that focuses on that part of the market. Inbound, yep, we, we sell a lot of flights. We do a lot of accommodation from the Indian consumer. Again, a market that's booming and returning back post-COVID. Um, where that stops, again, I think we'll hit those patterns that eventually things will start to flatten out in every market. Mm -hmm. But as a brand... You know, we're very interested in how we grow in each of those regions outside of purely just China. We've publicly said about that. We're, we're not shy from that, but we're not arrogant with it. We know that takes a long time. Um, but it's a very interesting market in terms of that middle class now and that wealth coming out. But again, that will start to plateau at a certain point. So what are the challenges when it comes to trying to tap into that outbound opportunity? Is it kind of differences in culture? Is it that there's going to be a lot of competition because everyone's trying to get that little slice of, it, of India? Um, or is it that just the output of demand is just going to be too much to kind of tackle all at once in an efficient way? What are the challenges here? Yeah, that's, that's one of the things that I like about working at Trip has been from day one, it's we want to globalize, we want to grow, we want to expand, and we, and we want to be quite aggressive with that. But again, not arrogant. But they also know that what we did in China doesn't work everywhere else. So it's not a copy and a paste. So whether it's India, whether it's the UK, whether it's Poland, whatever countries we're working mm -hmm. and points of sale that we drive, 
we localize those sites, not just in language, but in behaviors, uh, through data and understanding those customers. The demand patterns, the locations they go to are all different. So yes, there may be some brands out there that is a pure copy and paste globally. One thing I like about our business is very focused on the customer and their demand patterns, and we localize our sites for that behavior. So we'll touch a little bit about the differences between East and West, but um, I just want to touch a little bit of, uh, on, on Dubai in the Middle East. Yes. And Sarah also mentioned this is one of our uh, mega trends, this kind of huge boom in tourism in, in Dubai. But the, the, the analysis shows that the amount of demand is simply too much um, uh, to kind of match the hotel capacity that's in, in Dubai. So we're going to see this big boom in short term rental supply in the region. How heavily are you investing into the Middle East and that short term rental market in particular? Uh, so in terms of growing our portfolio in the Middle East, we're investing in our supply teams to, to contract accommodation. Um, we are investing in our sites. They're the most complex sites to build in terms of, of language right to left rather than left to right. So that's mm -hmm. the most complex technology in the OTA markets when you're localizing. Um, but we're making great strides there. We're building our teams up in the Middle East and we have great partnerships with a number of the, the Emiratis out there. Now, in terms of vacation rentals and the growth of that, that market, yes, it will. Um, what I've seen in Dubai of when I was working there a few years ago to where it is now, it's, it's packed, it's rammed. But they have bold ambitions to grow and build more properties very, very quickly. What you don't want to do is the standards to drop from that. You still need to keep the standards high because that's what the market's known for in terms of its luxury and mm -hmm. that's the demand of the consumer. Dubai got a massive boost because of COVID because you could go there, the restrictions were less and therefore people went there for guaranteed sun. We've started to see that as a destination drop a little bit, but it's definitely taken a boom out, out of COVID and will be there and will retain that. The rest of the Middle East, obviously, Saudi is, is investing heavily. Yes. With Neom and everything else that it's looking to do, and also then with its new airlines and its, its infrastructure, it's, it's going to be a player. Again, taking the political elements or the consumer view out of it, it is going to be a player in that marketplace. Abu Dhabi has started to take a different perception of what it's trying to be. It's mm -hmm. not trying to compete with Dubai anymore. It's trying to do something different. So I think you will see different elements of the marketplace. There's plenty of capacity in, in Abu Dhabi, but Dubai has these bold ambitions in the next five years to double its capacity. Um, Is that all hotel or short-term rental? That's, that's, that's accommodation. Accommodation, and, and okay. Uh, okay. Within the, the next five years. Um, we Great. Can't, we can't even build a third runway, let alone uh, do that in, 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 a, in a few years. So it's a bold ambition, but I'm sure they'll do it. Hey, Skiff listeners, hear about the latest trends in the travel industry with the brand USA Talks Travel Podcast. Right now, listen to special live from IPW interviews featuring U.S. Travel's Jeff Freeman. DMOs are at the heartbeat of U.S. Travel. Liz Bittner from Travel South. A lot of key gateway markets are back. L.A. Tourism's Adam Burke. We all win when we all partner together. Plus, brand USA's Stacey Melman and Jackie Ennis with international travel trends and Chris Thompson's farewell finale. I'm Mark Flapitas. Join us for brand USA Talks Travel on your favorite podcast platform. Brand USA Talks Travel. Let's kind of shift topic and talk a little bit about East versus West. We've already touched on this a little bit, but you lead kind of EMEA of Trip.com. What have the challenges been coming originally from being kind of a predominantly Asian company to coming into Europe and the US and the Middle East? How have the consumers, what are the, how have the preferences of consumers differed between East and West? Yeah, when I joined post-COVID, so you had the different demand patterns, different language, different locations, you know, trying to... I showed the, the, the Brits running to put the towels down by the pool video yeah. to people in Shanghai, and they, they find it absolutely amazing. What is this? What's going on? Um, so we joke about those things, but in general, there's very different patterns. But Europe, within its countries, within Europe, has very different patterns and understanding. So for us, it's about understand the consumer, understand the data, and solve for that demand. They've been very embracing about that. They've empowered us to understand our markets, bring in people and resources, and build our sites out for that European customer, whilst also then accommodating the inbound Asia customer. So that's where a lot of our investments are, whether that be in technology, whether that be in people, whether that be in our partnerships. Um, I think maybe you can just show this picture. So I was recently in, in Thailand just before Christmas, and one of the differences between East and West was, was particularly stark was 
So I went to a Saturday night market in Thailand, say, and every other stall had a, an influencer who was streaming um, the products of that stall to their, to their followers. And you can see on this picture here, I, I took this in Chiang Mai in Thailand, and their followers would be buying their products online or through, through the channel. And you can see there's a little laptop at the bottom there. There was a woman sitting, taking inventory of all the supply that was being sold. I mean, you, you don't see this in, 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 in London and in Shoreditch. Like, you don't, you don't see this. Yet. 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 Yeah, but Yet. That, I guess that's the question. Is this kind of social streaming, can it come to the West? And more importantly, can it actually work in the West? Okay, I, I think the, the other picture tells yeah. a thousand stories, but let me just give you a couple of bits from this. Uh, this is James Lang, our founder and chairman. He does live streams every month to the Asia audience. And some of those four-hour live streams have produced nearly $56 million of GMV in one show and 180 million uh, watchers. In Asia? In, in Asia, yes. In Asia, yeah. Now, you also see there's a, there's a panda bear and a cuddly toy there. Um, <laughs> Those sorts of things you'll see on the C-Trip site, the characters, the cultural elements of it, that's very different to the European customer. Will it come here? Yeah, I have no doubt it will come here at all. So am I going to be dressed up like that doing a show one day? Well, maybe I will. I've done some strange things in travel, so um, who knows? For my generation, I don't think they'll buy into it. The younger generations most absolutely will. Um, it amazes me that we bought laptops for my kids to do their homework on. They don't use them, they use their phone. Um, my son claims to have watched all the Squid Game. He's done it on TikTok. He's seen 30 <laughs> seconds of each episode, but he knows the final story and he knows what happened. Um, that's how they consume their lives. It's all there on a phone, quick, instant. That's the mentality. This works very well in Asia. Um, we will be testing it in Europe. And um, yeah, I don't think my kids will be impressed if dad's doing that. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> It most certainly works, but those numbers I've, I've shared with you, it's a, it's a very much cultural different market. But again, that's why it's not about globalization, it's localization. Um, maybe you might be able to answer this. What percentage of your ad dollars are you investing in social streaming as a form of e-commerce in Asia versus in, in Europe? Is, is, is it going to be is it on par yet? It, it's, it's on par now, yes. We've, okay. We've shifted a lot of our marketing dollars into the digital channels in, yeah. in recent times. That funnel is getting more complex and longer. Mm -hmm. I remember a previous brand, we turned off uh, social media probably about 10 years ago because it didn't work. But that's because we did a 30-day cookie and social media was at 33 days. So it didn't come in my reporting. It looked like we were just wasting money. That social media inspiration for the older generations is about 45 days now. Okay. For the younger generations, that social media interaction is all the way through every part of the funnel, all the way to the day before and after. I think that's fascinating because travel is something that you might only buy once or twice in a year, but now through social media, you can engage consumers all year around. And I think that's, that's pretty, I think that's, that's a game changer, really. So um, kind of let's talk a little bit, little bit about AI and Trip.com was one of the first OTAs to incorporate generative AI. I think pretty much immediately Trip.com was, was there and it launched uh, uh, Trip, Trip Genie, right? Yes. So what is the significance of AI in your uh, long-term strategy? It, it's, it's done a number of things. Uh, uh, here you can see on the screen in terms of content around best products, around inspiration, about personalization. Trip Genie is our AI bot that will give you personalized trips. Um, the power of AI, though, it's, al it's always been there, or machine learning and AI has always been there, but now it's much faster, it's much smarter, it's more data, so it processes much quicker. Um, I remember last year, hallucinate was one, I think it was dictionary.com's word of the year because <coughs> AI could produce incorrect information. We're, we're not seeing that. If, you, if you've got the right AI and you're getting the right information out of it, customers are hugely engaged with it. 70% of our customer service is now solved by AI, not as a chatbot, not just purely FAQs, but actual specific pre-trip, post-trip answers of what they're looking for, inspiration, and it plays a part again through the full funnel rather than just solving complaints or giving FAQs. For the inspiration element, but then also the brand perception, we've seen our Trustpilot scores go through the roof since we launched, uh, launched Trip Genie. 
I think we kind of touched on this with the session with Contiki just, just now about how services become really, really paramount and people want that personalization. And I think AI really has the ability to tap into that super hyper personalization of getting to know your consumers or, or on a much kind of deeper level. How are you using AI and kind of advanced data analytics to allow greater personalization yeah. of your offering and of the booking booking process? So I think, think the video tells a lot of it, that personalization yes. about trips and building trips, but personalized to your wants and needs. It knows you probably to some extent a lot smarter than we know ourselves. And that sounds scary. Um, again, the younger generations, they don't care. They will share their data with you or they will share it with Trip Genie, and it will give that instant messaging or ideas, inspiration, pricing, whatever it is that they're looking for very, very quickly, but it fits their needs. It understands them through data, but it's that processing speed that, that really allows that to accelerate quicker. Um, and then it has really just improved the customer service element. Mm -hmm. As long as you've got the right AI and you've got the right information processing that behind. Look, I'm not going to hide. We're, we're a I'm very lucky to work in a business that's got 10,000 engineers. So we've been able to build that sort of stuff very quickly and put it into market. Mm -hmm. But the accuracy of it is, is excellent. I just want to touch back. You said you're not using a chatbot. What's the difference between a chatbot and other forms of Mo AI? Most chatbots tend to be a list of FAQs. Mm -hmm. And it will give the answer. Usually, is not the answer you're looking for. But can you not use a more advanced form yeah, of chatbot? Yeah, a proper AI chatbot right, will yes. give you the right answers, the specific answers to your questions. But it will understand your language. It will understand the words that you're using rather mm. than just, oh, I think it's to do with this. But actually, the answer isn't. Are you the kind of data that you're now collecting based on this? Is it change? Are you now more proactively reaching out to your consumers? To, to be like, oh, OK, I see that you have this business trip coming up. I know about why don't you add on this leisure trip? Are you doing that more kind of proactive? Yeah, we, we, we still have a contact center. And someone said to me beforehand, you really you still have a contact center? Yes, we do, because we see service actually as a, as a benefit, not a cost. Yes. Now, that AI can go back into those teams and provide them, again, with better answers, better information. It allows us to then take our website and our app and then change that to make sure we're solving for any pain points the customers have. Mm -hmm. um, particularly when it comes to low-cost airlines with baggage and elements such as that, it's enabling us to develop that and solve for the Q&A that consumers have so they aren't turning up with the wrong information or no boarding pass or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, again, it gives you that data to learn as your business, but it's, it's helping the customer so much. Great. So yeah, please do send your questions in. Um, but we've got an interesting one here. Why would a young European consumer book a hotel from a live stream? What's the advantage? So the, the one I mentioned earlier, we had four big global hotel chains be part of that live stream. And they provided deals or offers. They were very engaged. But what you can show is the content. You can show the videos. You can bring it to life. It's, it's not just... Yeah. Here's an email and it's static. It's not just an image on a website. You can really bring it to life. You can talk about it. You can interview someone one-to-one -to, -one to ask mm -hmm. them that. And then people can also interact with that live stream. Can I ask, OK, what's your bar like? What's the pool like? Can you tell me? And they'll talk about it. And then can very quickly interact with it and provide the imagery or send those on to those customers as well. So again, if you think back to the behaviors of the younger generations who want to see all that, to them, it's about that picture, that imagery, that, that dream in their mind, mm -hmm. not the transactional element. Yeah, wanderlust is a, is a powerful thing. I think one thing that I think TikTok is very good at is it promotes off the beaten track, kind of less well-known destinations or that little cafe you might not have heard of that might not be on a TripAdvisor and you know, an influencer or whatever on TikTok can, can, can really advertise that. And I think that has implications on overcrowding and... Uh, you know, over tourism, and it has, it does have an implication on responsibly traveling. So are you seeing that there's greater demand for less well-known locations because of the rise of social media? Uh, you, you are always still going to have your, your top 10 cities around the world will still be the top 10 cities. Okay. Dubai's definitely jumped into that. Uh, well, that will play around, but it will always get back to uh, an equilibrium of those top 10 will still tend to be that. But yes, you're always going to get different emerging patterns. Again, the younger generations want more an experience. They want to show the picture. A lot to them is, hello, look at me, look what I did. They will downgrade to some extent the value of their flight and even now some of their accommodation to pay for more experiences. 
So you are going to see more of the off the beaten track, the different types of experiences that they do. Whereas the traditional tourists, when they do go to a top 10 city, mm -hmm. will do Buckingham Palace, they will do the London Eye, they will go to Trafalgar Square, they will do all of those. The younger generations will do a hybrid of the two. That's interesting. We've got um, some, yeah, some more questions. How do you expect the conflict between Gaza and Israel to impact the demand for places like Dubai and Jeddah? Um, we, we are not seeing any impact at the moment. And looking at, at Google's data as well, we're not seeing the impact of that. Again, I think that comes to a balance between price, perception, um, and, and how close you see that to the, the Dubai market. So we're not seeing that. I don't see that in the market data at the moment. Um, so I don't see a challenge right now. Um, political instability can always impact our industry. I think we've been through that. This is my 32nd year in travel. There's always something every year that will affect it. Yeah, travel itself is a mega trend for sure. Um, yeah, another interesting question here. How do you scale marketing with a high, higher number of smaller influencers? I think that's a great question. Uh, so they keep calling themselves what now? Key, uh, key opinion leaders now. KOLs now. Oh, they're, okay. They're, they're key um, opinion leaders. Yeah, the high aspirations. Um, Chief key opinion leader, I can see that. Uh, that, that, will be, that, that will be the next one, yeah. <laughs> um, it's about authenticity of it. That's, that's the most important thing. I do describe it as I mentioned about my daughter. Would she listen to me with 30 years of travel experience? No. Would she listen to Claire, who's got 2 million followers? Yes. Um, but as long as she trusts her, if she's authentic and can give the right information. And again, these influencers will really be empowered by AI if they think about it, because that will give them more credibility and the right accurate information to give, rather than someone paid for me to go here and film something. Yeah. That's where they could actually become hugely, hugely influential in the industry. Great. I think with that, we'll, we'll end at top of our time here. Thank you so much. You that was much. really Thank fascinating. You Thank you. This has been the Skift Podcast. Thank you for listening.